Well, thank you to the organizers uh, very much for the opportunity to speak. Uh, I'm Ian Runnels from the University of Virginia. And uh, today I am going to tell you about some uh, structural results regarding uh, subgroups of mapping class groups. So we'll start with our uh, cast of characters for the talk today. So S will be a surface of some amount of genus uh, and some number of punctures. And uh, I suppose nowadays I should say of a finite type. So both G and P are, are finite. Um, we define the mapping class group to be the group of orientation preserving homeomorphisms of S, preserving the set of punctures, uh, and then we quotient out by, by homotopy. So this is our ambient group uh, today. And we're going to be looking at subgroups of a particular form, um, namely writing the Larton groups. So these are defined using uh, simplicial graphs. So, you know, graphs with no uh, loops or, or multiple edges between vertices. So given such a graph, we can just define um, the writing of Larton group on gamma by this presentation where we're uh, generated by the vertices. And uh, the only relations that we have are commutations between vertices which span edges in our graph. Um, right, so we're trying to embed groups of this form into the mapping class group. So uh, what kind of elements in the mapping class group do we have to work with? So there's this uh, classification due to Thurston, uh, extending work of Nielsen, which says that there's sort of uh, three flavors that elements of the mapping class group can come in. Uh, so first we have finite order things, our torsion elements. So here's an example, um, what's called a hyperelliptic involution. We take our surface of genus G and we kind of skewer it through the middle uh, and do a full rotation about that axis. Uh, however, Right angle Lorton groups are, are torsion free, so we don't really care about those for today. So, in terms of the infinite order elements um, in the mapping class group, these come in two types. So, the first is reducible. Um, so, for example, uh, here we have what's called the Dane twist. So, I take the red curve and any uh, curve that intersects it, like the blue curve, I sort of just surger it so that I wind once around the red curve. Um, so here I've twisted the blue curve around the red curve. And uh, the salient feature of these reducibles is that while they fix some curves, like the stain twist fixes the red curve, um, they don't fix the curves intersecting uh, what's called the canonical reduction system. Uh, and then we have pseudo -anosobes. Uh This is the, the third part of the trichotomy. I don't really know how to draw them, uh, but the main idea is that if I take any curve and I look at uh, all of its iterates under a pseudo Anasov. Eventually, I'll fill up the surface uh, and converge to uh, some sort of filling lamination on the surface. Uh, in particular, no power fixes any simple closed curve on the surface. OK, um, so a little bit of notation. Um, I'm lying a little bit here, but for today, a pure mapping class is going to be either a pseudo Anasov or something which is pseudo Anasov on some proper subsurface uh, of S and identity on all of the complementary components. And I should note that every mapping class has some power which uh, satisfies this property. So if we want to generate these groups, these writing of Larton groups, which have these very simple presentations, um, we have to fight against existing relations in the mapping class group. Uh, so these are our enemies. Um, and you know, uh, there's some very well known ones among just even Dane twists. Um, so these include, uh, there's this conjugation relation, which says if I take a Dane twist and conjugate it by some homeomorphism, it's still a Dane twist, right? All I'm doing is I'm moving the curve I'm twisting about A by the homeomorphism F and then doing the Dane twist there. Uh, we also have a braid relation that pops up uh, so if I have two curves which intersect once, then um, their Dane twists will satisfy the braid relation. And then something slightly more complicated is uh, we have this lantern relation. So here I have this four-hold sphere, and you can show very directly just using pictures uh, that if I simultaneously twist around all of the boundary curves, 
Uh, it's the same as sequentially twisting about like the red curve and the green curve and the blue curve. And so um, if I just take some arbitrary collection of, of mapping classes, I can write them as products of Dane twists and relations like these uh, could conspire to give me relations among my mapping classes. And so we're, we're trying to figure out a way for that to not happen. Uh, so here are some sort of first results regarding um, free groups sitting inside of mapping class groups. So obviously free groups are a subset of, of RAG, so this is a good place to start. Uh, so we have this theorem of Ishida, which uh, completely classifies groups generated by two Dane twists. Uh, so if the curves are disjoint, then the Dane twists commute. Uh, if they intersect once, as I said, we have this braid relation that pops up and turns out uh, as long as my intersection number is at least two, uh, these Dane twists generate a free group. And pushing this a little further, um, I can look at what are called multi-twists, which are just you simultaneously twist along disjoint curves. Um, so if I have two such collections of curves, as long as there's some amount of intersection between them, uh, the, the multi-twists about those curves may not generate a free group uh, on the nose, but after passing to, say, fourth powers, uh, you'll get a free group. And this was proved by Hamidi Tarani. Uh, so this idea that uh, passing to powers kills relations is sort of the theme for today's talk. Uh, and this is exactly what you do um, very classically in like hyperbolic geometry. Uh, there's this shot key construction for subgroups of uh, PSL2R acting on hyperbolic space. If I take two hyperbolic isometries and take very large powers of them, they'll generate a free group. And it was precisely this idea that inspired Ivanov um, to prove the following. So if I take some finite collection of pseudo Anosovs satisfying this independence condition, uh, which just means that like they have distinct fixed points in the boundary of Teichmuller space, um, then for all sufficiently large powers, um, their, their powers will generate a free group. So uh, this is really analogous to the shock construction in hyperbolic space. Uh, but uh, as we saw, if you have two disjoint Dane twists um, or Dane twists about disjoint curves, they commute. Uh, so we can't generate a free group in that case. However, um, we can hope to maybe generate a right angle argument group. So this is true. This is a theorem of Coberta, uh, which says that if I take some collection of pure mapping classes uh, under the assumption that you know, their supports are connected, then, um, then there is, again, some large power of them, which will generate not just a right angle Lorton group, but sort of the expected right angle Lorton group. So um, I could build a graph. Uh, whose vertices are my subsurfaces, and I put edges between subsurfaces, which can be realized disjointly, um, and it's precisely the writing alert group on this graph that I'm going to get after passing the powers. So um, let's say you want to be really hands-on and, and build these um, RAG subgroups very explicitly. Um, Maybe you have like a favorite rag and you want to embed it in some mapping class group to try to try to prove something. So you can do this. It's this nice construction due to uh, Clay, Langer, and Magahas, which goes as follows. So uh, given a graph gamma, um, I can find some surface and some collection of subsurfaces whose co-intersection graph, which I just described, um, is gamma. And I call this um, collection of subsurfaces a realization if in addition to um, satisfying the right intersection relations, I have that if two subsurfaces intersect at all, um, their boundaries necessarily intersect. Uh, so this excludes including the whole surface uh, in my collection, and it also excludes uh, nested subsurfaces. So it's a little restrictive, but um, here's like a, a visual for how to think about this. So I have this pentagon graph, um, and I have this surface of genus five on the right. And if I take as my subsurfaces, um, these genus two subsurfaces with one boundary component, whose boundary curves are colored um, appropriately, then 
this is going to be a realization of the pentagon. Um, I could also just take the curves that I've drawn on the surface and not think of them as boundary curves, but just as the curves themselves. And this is also a realization. Okay. Um, so the theorem that Clay Leininger and Makahas prove is that if I have this realization, uh, that there exists an explicit constant depending on the topology of these subsurfaces and how they intersect, um, such that all sufficiently large powers uh, generate the expected writing of the Larton group. And moreover, they show that um, after possibly increasing the powers a little bit in a controlled way, that the subgroup is actually undistorted in the mapping class group. So um, what we want then is this explicit constant, like we have in the clay leininger mcgahas construction, without the restrictions of a realization. So we want to be able to include nested subsurfaces. Uh, we want to include the whole surface so that we can actually talk about pseudo-nosovs. And we can do this. Um, so here's the, the main theorem for the talk. We put the same hypotheses as Coberta's theorem, but now um, I can find some explicit functions L and M and C, um, which depend on the collection of mapping classes and the subsurfaces, and here uh, delta is like a hyperbolicity constant for the curve graph, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, so here's this explicit constant such that for all uh, powers bigger than this constant, the same conclusion as clay leininger mcgahas holds. So I get the expected writing alerting group, and I can say that it's undistorted in the mapping class group. Uh, and if you were just curious as to what this constant looks like, um, if all of my mapping classes are Dane twists, then this constant is really just looking at um, the biggest intersection number between any pair of curves. And um, if you, you know, chase through the, the proof and chase the constants through the proof, uh, you can actually show that for two pseudo um this constant is actually it only depends on S. Um, and it might not even depend on S, I'm not sure, but it certainly only depends on S if it depends on S at all. Um, and this was, for example, known to um, like Fujiwara proved that uh, if I have some things happen, acting hyperbolically on um, hyperbolic graphs, then um, a similar statement holds that they, there's some power that depends only on like the hyperbolicity of the graph and maybe some acylindricity constants. Uh, such that these things generate free groups. Okay, how do we prove such a statement? What are the tools that we're going to use? Uh, so the first is a ping pong lemma for writing the Larton groups, which is a sort of natural extension of ping pong for, for free groups in the classical case. Um, and then in order to play ping pong, we have to specify some sort of group action on a set. Our sets are going to be given in terms of what are called subsurface projections, I'll describe, uh, and then we have to use a little bit of um, Gromov hyperbolic geometry. And really, these um, these last two sort of mingle together under the umbrella of what's called uh, the Mazur-Minsky machinery. Okay, um, so we'll start with ping pong, and we'll remind ourselves how it works in the classical case. Uh, so I have a group acting on a set X, and I have I just pick two elements, G1 and G2. I want to find conditions that I can impose on the group action, uh, which guarantee that these two elements generate a free subgroup of G. So the idea is that um, I have these two subsets, which I usually require to be disjoint. And uh, you know, G1 acts by taking points in X2 into X1, and uh, vice versa, uh, G2 acts by taking points in X1 x2. So if I look at a word in the abstract free group generated by g1 and g2, um, it has a normal form, just alternating powers of g1 and g2. Um, and given these conditions, you can see that I just take a, a point in one of the sets and it gets bounced back and forth. Uh, so the conclusion is that under these assumptions, g1 and g2 generate a free group. Uh, now, for rags, we have to be a little more careful because um, we have commuting things and we have to figure out how to handle that. So 
we start sort of the same way. We take some collection of elements, and to each one we have some, some sets that we're going to require to be disjoint. Um, we also require that inside of each set we have some smaller subset, uh, which we denote with an apostrophe, um, which is going to be sort of coarsely preserved under the action of commuting things. So what I mean by that. So um, if I have two non-commuting things, then I have more or less what I had before, except it's a little stronger. So GI takes all of XJ into this small subset. Um, so it's, it's stronger than in the classical ping pong case um, for GI and GA not commuting. Um, but for commuting elements, um, what I'm going to require is that uh, if I take some word that commutes with GI, then I might mix up XI a little bit, but um, the whole point is that I only move it some bounded amount. So this, this subset XI prime gets moved, but it stays within XI. So it's sort of coarsely preserved. Um, so under these hypotheses, you get the same conclusion uh, that your collection of elements generates uh, the, the expected writing of the group. Um, so, in order to play ping pong, we have to we have to have some sort of table to play on, some sort of set to act on. Uh, for today, X is going to be uh, the curve complex of the surface. So let's remind ourselves of what this is. Uh, so the vertices, it's a simplicial complex. So the vertices are um, all the homotopy classes of essential simple closed curves, and the one skeleton. Um, is corresponds to edges which can be realized disjointly. So uh, two vertices span an edge if their geometric intersection number is zero. And uh, normally, we like people like to build this full thing, this full flag complex. Um, but for today, we're really just going to focus on the one skeleton. Uh, so we call this the curve graph rather than the curve complex. Um, so if we, you know, make all of the edges length one, then this becomes a metric space, and uh, the mapping class group acts by isometry, right? Like a home, like a, a homeomorphism is going to preserve uh, disjointness between curves, so it's going to preserve distances in this graph metric. So it's a theorem of uh, Mazur and Minsky that this uh, curve graph is delta hyperbolic. For some delta that a priori depends on the on the surface, uh, and this is really nice because this allows us to use techniques from from geometric theory and, and hyperbolic geometry uh, to sort of probe the action of the mapping class group on the space. Um, and maybe I'll just say that um, a while after this was published, uh, several people independently showed that. Um, Delta can be made independent of the surface, and so there's a uniform delta over all curve graphs, so that they're all delta hyperbolic. Um, and you can actually have a lot of control over this constant. So work of Hensel, Shadinsky, Webb shows that you can actually take delta just to be 17. Um, right. So that's our set. That's our big set that we're acting on. Um, so for ping pong, we need these smaller subsets, uh, and these are going to be given in terms of what are called subsurface projections. So this is an idea, um, you know, most often attributed to Mazur Minsky, but to some, in some way, it goes back to work of, of Ivanov. So how do, what is, what is this idea? Um, so if I have a subsurface, I have a natural inclusion of the curve complex of that thing abstractly as a surface into the curve complex of the ambient surface. Um, and you know, it's shown in Mazur-Minsky that these curve complexes have infinite diameter, but uh, under this inclusion, the curve complex of a subsurface becomes a bounded diameter set because all of the curves in the subsurface are, are disjoint from the boundary curves of the subsurface. Um, and so if we think about the inclusion of the mapping class group of that sub, uh, subsurface, uh, we enact not only on the curve complex of the subsurface, but on the whole surface. And we want to approximate the action of uh, the subgroup on the whole curve complex by somehow projecting curves to the subcomplex where we, you know, understand the action quite well. 
So, you know, what subsurface projection is, is actually quite simple. So I have my, my surface S, and let's say here we have this one whole torus subsurface. Um, so how do I project curves to this S prime? Well, if I live in S prime already, I project to myself. Uh, this is kind of weird. If I'm disjoint from the subsurface, the, you should define the projection to be empty. And then what's left is I have curves um, which non-trivially intersect the boundary of my subsurface. And uh, I construct the projection by surgering arcs of C with arcs of the boundary of the subsurface to get curves that live in the subsurface. So in this case, um, turns out that this curve A actually lives in the projection of C to S prime. And so this is how we're going to um, approximate the action of say some F supported on S prime um, on the whole curve complexes by projecting all of the curves onto S prime and looking how this mapping class moves them there. Um, so we can also project curves to annuli, but you have to be a little bit careful, right? Because like an annulus only has one curve, it's, it's core. Uh, so how do we project curves to annuli? Um, so we have, here's our little bit of our, our surface and we have this red curve. Well, we can lift to the universal cover. Um, and as an element of pi one, this curve corresponds to some hyperbolic isometry, which has an axis, right? Um, and let's say this axis is the sort of middle uh, geodesic that I've drawn. Then if we quotient H2 by the action of this hyperbolic isometry, what I get is some intermediate cover, which is homeomorphic to um, this infinite open annulus, uh, which I can then compactify. And uh, what ends up happening is that the axis of this isometry ends up folding up and, and closing up into uh, the core curve of this annulus. So then given some curve B, which intersects my red curve, um, I just lift it up to the universal cover, project it to this intermediate cover, I'm going to get some collection of arcs in this annulus, uh, which cross the, the core curve and connect the two boundary components. And that's what I'm going to call my projection of B to A. Um, so you have to be a little bit careful with annuli. Um, so then, now that we can project curves to subsurfaces, we can look at um, how close or far apart curves are in these subsurfaces. Uh, by defining their projection distance. So given any two curves, A and B, um, I project them to my subsurface and I look at the minimum distance between anything I get via this projection construction um, and define that to be their distance in the subsurface. So first we have this it's sort of technical lemma. Um, the idea is that uh, subsurface projection is like a, a topological construction. So if I do a homeomorphism supported far away from the subsurface I'm projecting to, I shouldn't affect uh, what my projections look like because they're, they're topological and I'm doing the action far away. Um, so a particular uh, mapping classes supported away from subsurfaces um, don't change subsurface projections at all for non-annular subsurfaces and change them by, by a bounded amount for, for annular subsurfaces. So then for ping pong, right, um, we needed this condition that uh, commuting things don't affect the corresponding sets by much, and that's exactly the rule of this lemma. Uh, we also have um, this nice, um, what's called bear socks inequality, this is going to be used to guarantee that um, our sets are disjoint and actually allows us to play to play ping pong. So um, here's the statement of it. Uh, but the idea, right, is like I have these three subsurfaces and they're all bounded diameter in the big curve complex. And if I stand at SI, uh, then maybe SJ and SK look very far apart. But then if I uh, change my point of view and stand on SJ and look at SI and SK, then they look very close together. So from the point of view of one subsurface, 
two other subsurfaces look very far apart, then when I turn my head and look from the point of view of one of those subsurfaces, uh, the other two have to look very close together. Um, and then for the undistorted part of the, the main theorem, uh, we need a way of relating subsurface projections to uh, word length in the mapping class group, right? And this is taken care of by uh, what's called the Mazur-Minsky distance formula. So I'm not going to explain what all of these things are, just give you, tell you that word length in the mapping class group can be coarsely measured by uh, summing up subsurface projections over all, sub, uh, all subsurfaces and sort of taking only the ones that are, that are big enough. Right. Um, so the last piece we need to play ping pong is um, the action of non-commuting elements sort of exchanging each other's sets. Um, so Mazur Minsky proved that um, pseudo Anasovs acting on the curve complex are very much like hyperbolic isometries uh, in, a, in a precise sense. So uh, there's some constant so that if I take powers of my pseudo Anasov, uh, I'm roughly acting by translation by the power. And so if I take any curve uh, B in my, in my curve complex and look at its orbit under powers of F, uh, what I actually get is an F invariant quasi geodesic, analogous in the case of hyperbolic space, where like hyperbolic isometries have, have invariant axes. Um, but we want something um, a little more canonical for, for technical reasons. Um, so we don't want just uh, quasi geodesics, but, but honest geodesics. And it turns out we have those as well. So if I have a pseudo Anasov, there's some um, collection, some finite collection of bi-infinite geodesics, which are permuted uh, as I apply powers of F. Uh, and these are all you know, two delta fellow travelers, so they're all very close to each other. And the idea is that um, uh, for suitably large powers of my pseudo Anasov, um, I'm acting by translation along what's called this quasi-axis, the union of all of these bi-infinite geodesics. And then um, a couple of remarks. So if I have a reducible mapping class, it's, it's, on, it's pseudo and also on some subsurface. Um, so if I just restrict the action of this mapping class to this subcomplex, um, all of the same theorems hold. I have some geodesic, some invariant quasi-axis in this uh, curve subcomplex, which um, is acted on by translation, as acted on like a translation by the pseudo Nasov. Um, and uh, for the proof of the main theorem, I'm not just going to be considering subsurface projections, but nearest point projections to these quasi axes. Um, so in the case of a pseudo Nasov, right, I just take some nearest point projection onto this quasi axis. Uh, for reducible things, I first project to the relevant subsurface and then project that onto um, the relevant quasi-axis. And uh, in order to make all this work, I need uh, something that is slightly more general than the Bearsuck inequality, um, which is the following. And it, this is just the Bearsuck inequality for not just subsurface projections, but projections to geodesics, these nearest point projections that I'm going to be using. Uh, so here's the statement. It just says that if I, um, a curve has big projection along one axis relative to another axis, then if I switch the roles of the axes, um, the projection must look small. So it really is like a generalization of Bearsuck's inequality to this case. Um, right, so now uh, we can build our ping pong table. We have everything we need. So our set X is going to be um, the vertices of the curve graph. And for each mapping class, my associated subsets um, are defined like this. So it's the, to each FI, um, I have some invariant axis, call it alpha I. Uh, and I'm looking at all curves which have big projection along that axis relative to all of the other axes under consideration. Um, and then because of this, 
lemma that says that um, projections are only effective a bounded amount, uh, I, my Xi primes, I just bump up uh, the, the projection distance that I'm looking at. So then uh, by this generalized pair stock inequality, if I have two overlapping subsurfaces or two nested subsurfaces, um, then their corresponding sets are disjoint, which is what I wanted for ping pong. Um, like I said, by this lemma, if I have commuting mapping classes, then I don't change the projection distances by much. So um, I, I preserve, I coarsely preserve um, these xj primes. And then um, I can make big in enough in terms of this, right? So we have these results saying that uh, big enough powers of my pseudo Nossov x by a translation on quasi axis. Uh, so if I make in big enough, then this guarantees that if my projection distances, um, or if my, sorry, if my mapping classes don't commute, um, then I change the projection distances enough to switch from one set to the other. And that's, that's more or less, that's the proof. Um, that's how we play ping pong. All right, thank you.